how many of you know where you were when, let's say, Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons came out with Sherry Baby? How many of you remember where you were at when Neil Armstrong took the first steps on the moon? How many of you remember where you were when 9-11 occurred? Do you remember where you were at and what you were doing when COVID-19 broke out and they declared a lockdown? Where are you now? Where are you? Let's take a look at Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among her, her, they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some of the fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. Now I have to tell you that in this garden are two very famous trees. One we just talked about, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which God commanded them not to eat from. The other tree that was a very famous tree in that garden was called the tree of life. And as they would eat the fruit from the tree, the tree of life, they would live forever. Once they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, their eyes were opened and they hid. They went into hiding because they were separated by sin. And if you notice what took place after that, God calls to them. Do you think God didn't know where they were? He knew exactly where they were, but he knew that they were hiding. He wanted them to confess, to admit what they had done. But instead of admitting admitting what they had done, what did they do? They play the blame game. Adam says, it's that woman you gave me. It's her fault. And the woman turns around and says, it was the serpent. It was his fault. And because of this, God cursed two things. He cursed the serpent and said that he will crawl on his belly. He will be lower than the livestock. He will crawl on his belly. He will eat dust. And the other thing he cursed was the ground the ground that was producing natural things with minimal effort. He cursed the ground so it would have thorns and thistles. You see, there's consequences to the actions. For the woman, the consequences were increased pain in childbirth. And your desire for your and your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Not my words, that's scripture. He will rule over the woman. For the man, his consequences were that he had to be painfully toiling and by the sweat of his brow to be able to eat from the land. It was now going to be work and very difficult. You see, with... Disobedience comes consequences. And because of the disobedience, Adam and Eve had to leave the garden. 
two reasons. One is because of their sin, and now they knew good from evil. And so they had to be expelled from the garden. But the other reason they had to be expelled from the garden is, see, you must understand that that tree of life, if they were not expelled from the garden and they continued to eat that fruit, they would live forever in separation from God. So we think that God kicking them out of the garden was their punishment. But in reality, what looked as punishment would one day save their souls. Where are you hiding? And what are you hiding from? It's a big question. Where are you hiding and what are you hiding from? You know, America is hiding. We believers have had our head in the sand for much too long. You see, in 1973, there was a court case called Roe v. Wade where abortion became legal. Abortion on demand. And in that nearly 50 years, there's been close to 60 million lives aborted. 19 million are from black women. Do you know black women are five times more likely to have an abortion? And we say black lives matter. Abortion is the biggest killer of black children. It's not the police. It's not each other. It's abortion. You see, God tells us that thou shall not murder. But do we play the blame game here in America, just as Adam and Eve did? Do we say, well, it's those Supreme Court justices that did it. It was those politicians. I didn't vote for them. You know, there's a statistic out that says it's about 26% of all Christians vote. And then we have the nerve to say, I didn't vote for them. We have the nerve to complain about our politicians. We have a right to vote. And we as Christians should stand up and take that vote instead of playing the blame game, instead of saying it's only one vote, it doesn't matter. That's a lie from the devil. It's a lie from the pit of hell and it smells like smoke. My vote doesn't count. Oh, yes, it does. And you see, just as Adam and Eve and the serpent were, was cursed and the ground was cursed, America is cursed, not for reaching its full potential. You see, there's consequences to this Roe v. Wade. It depends on which side you look because Planned Parenthood will give you one figures. But the facts are that women who have abortions have a greater chance of experiencing depression and anxiety. A greater chance for substance abuse, alcohol, prescription pills, other things. And they even have a higher rate of suicide. Men, they're finding out, are having emotional distress also over this. Not to mention the economic curse that's come upon this land. You see, we complain that Social Security is out of money. But I tell you, if those 50 million babies had been born, there would be more than enough money to go around for Social Security. We would not be in the economic crisis that we are all because of Roe v. Wade. You know, sometimes we don't even want to look at that aspect. Especially Christians, we don't, well, we don't talk about money because God will provide. Well, yeah, how much more would He provide if there had not been Roe v. Wade? 
You know, I'm here to tell you that this expanse is getting greater between right and wrong. You see it in the riots. You see it in the COVID. You see it in all the different areas that it's not as much gray. The agreeing to disagree is not happening the way it used to. Now it's you're either for or you're against. You're pro-abortion, you're anti. You're pro this, you're anti that. The lines have gotten bigger. The expanse has gotten bigger. Let's take a look at Proverbs 14. It says, there is a way that appears to be but in the end it leads to death. There's a way that appears right. To us, as human beings, we say this is right, but in the end it leads to death. We say Roe v. Wade is right, but where has it led? To death. Let's take a, take a look at John 16, 1, 3. All I told you so that you will not fall away. Out of the is coming when anyone who they are offering a service to God. They're telling if they kill, they're doing a service to God. Planned Parenthood will tell you that. If you have an abortion, you're going to have more money. You'll be able to take care of the children you do have. You won't live in poverty. They'll think they're doing a service to God. But it's a lie from the devil. It's a lie from the pit of hell and it smells like smoke. I'm here to tell you the situation we're in today, God did not cause it. God did not cause the Roe v. Wade. God did not uh, cause the coronavirus. But he will take the coronavirus and he will use it as a test. A test for us believers. And I want us to take a look at what God's solution is to the test. What God's solution is into narrowing that great divide bringing us back where we need to be. And I know a lot of you have heard this scripture, but I want to break it down a little more. And I want to take a look at 2 Chronicles 7.14. If called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. You know, God brings healing and restoration after disasters. You take a look at when the Israelites were in exile in Babylon. And in Ezra and Nehemiah, where they came back and they rebuilt the temple. He brings healing and restoration after disaster. Take a look at Hurricane Andrew, something a little more current. I remember Hurricane Andrew happening and they say it would be years and years and years before we recovered from Hurricane Andrew. And I watched people pitch in. I watched people feed people who were without homes. I watched builders raise up those homes. In the you see, God brings healing and restoration shortly after disaster. So I tell you, this COVID virus is a disaster. This Roe v. Wade is a disaster. But after the disaster comes great healing and restoration. We people, we church are on the verge of something great happening. But it won't happen unless we do our part. And 2 Chronicles 7, 14 tells us exactly what we need to do. There is nothing left. There is absolutely nothing left except for to follow God's word. You see, the responsibility falls on his people. The responsibility 
on His people, not the unbelievers, not the politicians, not the um, Supreme Court. The responsibility falls on you and me. If my people, if my people, and we're going to tie all this in, it's going to come together in a full circle, and you're going to see how this fits together. But he says, if my people, who are called by my name, what do they have to do? Humble themselves. Let's take a look at a bullet point. Humility is the way forward. Humility is the way forward. Humility is how we begin to get out of this mess. I looked up the definition of humility in Webster's Dictionary, and it said, not proud or haughty, not arrogant or assertive, reflecting, expressing, or offered in a spirit of deference or submission. Let's look at Proverbs 11, 2. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with what? Humility comes wisdom. Humility is the core of this for you believers as my people. As God says, my people. Humility is the core of this because with humility comes the wisdom on what we need to do. And then he says, let's go back to our scripture. Second Chronicles. Humble themselves and pray. Pray. Now, if humility is the way forward, pray is the most effective way, the most important way that we have in contacting and reaching God. You see, it's even greater than prophecy. It's greater than speaking in tongues. It's greater than discerning of spirits. It's greater than all the gifts. God is looking for the heart of prayer. God is looking for the heart of prayer. And prayer deepens our communion and our relationship with God. Because with that, the humility comes the wisdom. With prayer comes the deepening our relationship and our communion and our understanding and our relationship with who God is. And so now we begin to pray what God wants us to pray. Humility, prayer, seek my face. God says to seek his face. What does he mean by that when he says seek my face? When you seek the face of God, what you are saying is God Find my desires to be your desires. I want to know the heart of God and to do His will. Seeking His face is surrendering my will to His will. Seeking His face, saying, you are God. You are the one who has the answers. You are the one that takes disaster and turns it into good. Yes. Seeking his face is a desire of your heart to know God and to do his will. And then he says we have to turn from our wicked. Now in the Old Testament, any time that this was brought up, it would mean that you would turn from one thing, and whenever you turn from one thing, it automatically led you to something else. So when you turn from your evil, you turn from your wicked ways, you're turning to God. 
So instead of my will, my desires, my flesh, it's now about God. As I seek his face, as I turn from my evil, as I repent from my sins, and when I do that, when I get away from my selfish, wicked ways and I turn to God, what happens? Then I will hear from heaven. He'll hear from heaven. That means he's sitting on the throne. He's the God, the King, the Almighty, the Wonderful, the All in All. We must do these things first in order for Him to hear and take action. So does that mean we don't humble ourselves, if we don't pray, if we don't seek His face, and, we're, and when we're offering up prayers, does that mean He's not hearing us? No, God always hears. He always knows. But the thing is, God hears everything, but He may not act on it as we would like Him. You see, in the same book of 2 Chronicles, it talks about the king Rehoboam, who was king of the southern kingdom of Judea. And the Pharaoh of Egypt is going to attack him. And he's going to take, him, take over and capture them. But Rehoboam humbles himself and God spares them. They're not captured. They're not taken into exile. But what God does allow is he allows the king of Egypt to come and plunder the temple taking all the valuables back to Egypt because God wanted him to know that there's a difference between serving man and serving God. There's a difference. You see, we'll hear heaven when we humble ourselves, when we seek his face, when we pray, when we turn for our wicked ways. He'll hear from heaven and when he hears... After we've done those things and he hears, then he will forgive their sins. He'll forgive their sins. Things that we've done wrong, things we've repented of, things that we've said, oh Lord, we've gone astray. That is why we did the confession of sin in the beginning because we need to come regularly before God. If you're anything like me, I constantly sin because I'm in this flesh. And because I'm in this flesh, I say stupid things. I do stupid things. I think stupid things. It doesn't give me a license to go sin, but it's a fact that I do because I'm still in the flesh. And so it's a constant reminder that I need to confess my sins. I need to continue to be humble. I need to continue to seek his face. I need to continue to pray. I need to continue to turn from my wicked ways. Why? So that God can hear from heaven and forgive me. And when all that takes place, a natural result will be that God will heal their land. God will hear heal their land. I'm telling you today, God desires to heal our land. We have been in a state of disaster for almost 50 years. We have been in a state of disaster with the COVID-19. And God wants to heal our land. You see, God wants us to partner with him. Let's look at John 15, verses 4 through 9. Remain in me, Jesus speaking. He says, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. 
If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. You remain in me, and my words remain in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. God wants us to partner with Him. Let's look at our next point. God wants us to partner with Him. It says apart from Him we can do nothing. But the next point we have is without Him, I can't. Without us, He won't. He wants to partner with us. Without Him, I can't. And without us, He won't. That's why in 2 Chronicles, he says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, he'll hear from heaven and he will heal our land. We have to remain in him. We have to remain in the vine. Because that's where we get our authority. That's where we get our nourishment. That's where we get our healing. That's where we get our deliverance. That's where we get nourished. That's where we get fed. If the vine is cut off at the root, the whole plant dies. So without him, I can't. Why God chose to partner with us I don't know. But if he doesn't, if we don't, he won't. He has chosen to work through people. So we need to partner with God and we need to partner with others. We need to partner with others in prayer. We need to partner with others in action. Brother Fred, with God Belongs in My City, was wanting to start a radio station. And you see, because of COVID, we are being forced to partner with each other. We have every Thursday night and every Saturday morning, our men's group meets on Zoom. Not a large group, but a small one. He's calling us to partner with Him and with each other. You see, Scripture tells us that when two or three are gathered together in His name, when two or three are gathered together in His name, I believe that's Matthew. Do we have that? Matthew 18, 20. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I with them. He's not talking about great masses. He's not talking about hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of people. He's talking that when two or three are gathered together in His name, God is forcing us to realize the strength of the church. God is forcing us through this COVID to realize that two or three can make a difference. Let's take a look at our next point. We are designed to make a difference. We are designed to make a difference. God created us to make a difference in this world. If you're asking what your purpose in life is, I'm going to tell you it's to make a difference in someone else's life. Make a difference individually and collectively. This is much bigger than us. You see, the church, the two or three gathered together in His name, it gives us our identity. It lets us know who we are. 
We are believers in Christ. We, His people, who are called by His name, we have an identity as His people. This COVID has brought to our attention that the two or three who are gathered in His name are His people. And that's why He wants us to partner with Him. That's why He wants us to partner with others. You see, it only needs to be two or three. So in all of this, what are we going to do? Are we going to hide in the garden like Adam and Eve did? So that God has to run around going, James, where are you? Are we going to play the blame game that Adam and Eve did? Oh, it's that woman you gave me. Oh, it's those politicians. Oh, it's those Supreme Court justices. Oh, it's the president. Oh, it's this. Oh, it's that. Are we going to play the blame game or are we going to get in the game? Are you, his people, going to humble thyself? Pray, seek his face? Turn from your wicked ways? I truly believe that if we do this, if we do these things, humble ourselves, pray, seek His face, turn from our wicked ways, I believe that if we do these, God will heal our land. Yes. You know, anytime something really big gets to happen, going to happen, the devil always throws a curveball in there. He tries to mess things up. Let me give you some biblical examples. When Moses was about to be born, Pharaoh told the midwives to kill all the boys. When a boy was born, they were told to kill them, to drown them in the Nile. But the midwives didn't do it. And when Pharaoh found out, he was pretty upset. He said, why aren't you doing it? He said, oh, these, these Hebrew women are so strong that they give birth before we even get there. And then Pharaoh said to him, okay, now go and kill all the boys. But Pharaoh didn't know that in that calamity, Moses' mother, after three months, put him in a basket and put him in the Nile. And Pharaoh's daughter found Moses. Not only did Pharaoh's daughter find Moses, but she asked Moses' mother, not knowing it was his mother, to feed the baby, to take care of the baby until he was big enough. God even does that. He even picked his own mother after she gave him up because he was going to be killed because the devil knew that something good was about to take place because a mighty man of God, Moses, was being born. He wanted to throw confusion in there. The same thing happened with Jesus. Herod wanted to kill all the boys under two years old because Jesus, the Messiah, was being born. Herod thought he was going to be displaced as a king. Every time something good is about to happen, Evil comes in and tries to steer it away. You see, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the evil powers of this dark age. The enemy is the one who's trying to throw all this at us. He's the one that's trying to get everything confused. He throws the corona in there and tries to get us off track because I'm going to tell you right here today that if we come together as his people, as it says in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, I tell you that Roe v. Wade will be overturned in four to six years. And in that four to six years, a black baby is going to be born for the next generation. And he will do great things and mighty things for the Lord and for humanity. When Roe v. Wade is overturned four to six years from now, 
a black baby for the next generation is going to be brought up, raised up to be a man of God. So where are we? Are we going to pass this test? Are we ready for this? Are we ready to humble ourselves? Are we ready to pray? Seek His face? Turn from our wicked ways? Are we ready? Are we ready? It's not someone else's job. It's not let's wait for someone else to step up. It's you. It's me. We are called to step up. Not in a prideful way, but in a way of humility. In a way of prayer. God pleading, Lord, too many babies have died. Too many people have died from this COVID-19. There is disaster and calamity all around us. And God is saying, if my people who are called by my name, if they will rise up and take their place, if they will become the men and women of God, you will see Roe v. Wade overturned. Are we doing our part? Are we going to pass the test?